So far in this class, you've learned about systems tracks and sequence photographic surfaces primarily from the perspective of studying outcrops. Um, but the purpose of this video is to cover some additional terms, most notably these things called parasequences, as well as this term, the sequence boundary, um, which you may encounter in other discussions. Uh, and you'll end up finding these, the application of these terms uh, tends to be a matter of scale mostly. And primarily, these terms will come in when looking at seismic profiles, um, as opposed to the uh, outcrop scales we've been focusing on primarily so far. So the idealized sequence, the cycle uh, here, contains these four system tracks, the low stand, the transgressive, high stand, falling stage. However, three of these system tracks, as you have learned before, the low stand, the high stand, and the falling stage, um, all form as the shoreline is, is undergoing regression. And this makes them very difficult to distinguish unless it's possible to separate things formed in normal regression to things formed in, in forced regression. And in outcrop, that's really only possible if you have the subaerial unconformity or the regressive surface of marine erosion. And those surfaces only form in particular typically very shallow environments. So as you'll see in this video, this poses challenges when you're looking at more offshore facies as well as when working at larger scales. So if you're a bit further away from the shoreline, you know, you don't have the fluvial uh, rocks in, in your section, it's pretty typical to see successions like this. So these, these um, cycles marked by the arrows here are uh, well-developed sort of shallowing upward successions. They reflect shoreline regression followed by fairly abrupt deepening um, that presumably reflects shoreline transgression. And so each of these shallowing upward successions should, in theory, contain the low stand systems tract, the falling stage, the high stand, and so forth, all of which form during this regressive phase of the base level cycle. But identifying them and subdividing them is really not very easy to do. Um, you know, it's regressive as it gets coarser and shallows upwards, but how can we tell whether it's normal or forced regressive? It's, it's not really feasible to do so. So these shallowing upward cycles are called parasequences. They're very, very common in, in coastal silsoclastics as well as in, in carbonate sections. And so a parasequence is defined as a relatively conformable shallowing upward succession of genetically related beds um, that are bounded by these things called flooding surfaces. And so the traditional parasequence shallows upwards from, say, offshore facies up to shore face or, or some shallower facies, and then it's capped by an abrupt deepening back to offshore, like is shown in this one and in the cycles on the previous slide. And so the red arrow here points to one of these flooding surfaces. It's very recognizable. It's a very abrupt change, typically from shallow water sandstones back to more offshore shales or other fine grain units. However, these Flooding surfaces, although they're very recognizable, have somewhat ambiguous interpretations sometimes. I mean, it just requires that the, the, there's sort of rapid deepening of, of the facies, but that could be from several different things. So, for example, this could be a transgressive ravinement surface. Maybe it's just a maximum regressive surface if there's very little deposition during the early stages of the transgression. Maybe it's even a within-trend surface where the, where the transgression actually starts earlier in the underlying sandstones. So it's often hard to tell, um, but if possible, it's really best to try and identify the surface more specifically as one of the sort of now standard sequence stratigraphic surfaces. But as I said, you might find that this is not really possible to do. It's not really easy to apply sort of the standardized terminology in these kind of settings. And that's fine, um, because the pattern of facey shifts here is pretty clear. Um, therefore, you know, what in, how we're going to interpret base level change also is pretty clear, regardless of whether we can apply the names that we would be able to otherwise. So another area in which the standard terminology is difficult to apply is when working at really large scales, as you might do working with seismic profiles, say, in the oil industry. So with outcrops, you maybe look at tens of meters, maybe a few hundred meters of section. Um, but with seismic profiles, you often have kilometers of, of strata. And so as such, it's, it's common with seismic data to refer to the system's tracks as being made of multiple parasequences. And so each parasequence is progradational. So you can see each of the, the sort of the smaller package in this diagram 
spilled outwards, but those para sequences then get stacked into larger scale sets where they all prograde out or they retrograde back. And so in this case, the progradation or retrogradation is defined on the shift of the para sequences as opposed to in individual base level cycles. And so the difference in terminology here is partially because of scale, um, but also because a lot of these seismic profiles that, that people look at in, in the oil industry include a lot of sort of offshore or deeper marine settings, whereas, as you saw earlier, it's difficult to apply the standard terminology that you would get in near-shore settings. You have a lot of these parasequences, it's, there's a flooding surface that bounds them, but it's not really clear what that might be. So one thing to note is that these, the scale of these systems tracks, the, the HST and the LST marked here and so forth, are very likely larger scale than the systems tracks. These are a bigger scale of base level change than the scale you would look at in the outcrop. And the little para sequences here are maybe more similar to the sequences you would identify in outcrop. And so you might also notice a few new names of surfaces here. So there's the transgressive surface. There's this thing called the sequence boundary. Um, and we haven't talked about these before um, for, for a couple reasons. Um, so one, starting with the transgressive surface, it marks the change from regression to transgression. So in this case, it's going to be the boundary between the low stand and the transgressive systems tract. So the terms we've seen before for this would be, say, the transgressive ravinement surface or the maximum regressive surface. So why don't we use these names here? Well, partly those names are, are sort of newer developments, but also at this scale, uh, you know, the transgressive surface here is some combination of those two. It's, it's, it's some combination of the ravinement surface and the maximum regressive surface, probably mostly the maximum regressive surface. But importantly, with this sort of scale of, of analysis, it can be hard to tell if there's erosive, if it's an erosive surface, like a ravinement surface, or if it's not erosive. So the term transgressive surface can be more a more generic name for this when you can't really tell whether it's ravinement or just a conformable maximum regressive surface, perhaps. And so finally, this thing called the sequence boundary. Well, this had a long and quite contentious history. So as its name suggests, the sequence boundary is just a boundary between one sequence and the next. Um, but the recognition and where to place a sequence boundary was the source of quite a lot of, of quite intense disagreement for several decades even after sequence stratigraphy was first developed in the 1970s. And part of this is because these sequences are cycles, and so there's no obvious place to put a sequence boundary. But it really turns out that these disagreements were based on sort of arguments over terminology and, and models. And the key point is that the surfaces we've learned about before, like the subaerial unconformity, or the maximum flooding surface, transgressive ravinement surface, and so forth, those can be objectively identified on the basis of observations and, and data. And the choice of, of how, you, how you decide to combine those into a sequence boundary is sort of entirely model-driven. It's based on what sort of terminology you prefer, and so it's, it's somewhat less important. Generally, most people who come up with sort of sequence boundary definitions have included the subaerial unconformity as an important part of it. That makes sense. The subaerial unconformity is a very distinctive surface, both in outcrop and also in these seismic sections. And so most of the disagreements really focused on where to place the sequence boundary in the deeper settings. You know, for example, do we use the basal surface to force regression, so be below the falling stage deposits? Or do we, include, do we use the correlative conformity, which would be sort of between the falling stage and the low stand deposits? Well, either is fine, you know. Um, you know, and those services we haven't really talked much about because they're not really recognizable in outcrop, but they can be identified pretty readily in these seismic profiles. So, you know, what, just to note, there's no real objective way of deciding what should be your sequence boundary. There's a variety of, of models out there, but just be clear about what you're doing and, and how you're defining it. So really the main take-home message in this video is that the sequence stratigraphic terminology and the application of, of the sequence stratigraphic methods um, can differ somewhat between outcrop scales and seismic scales. We've been focusing primarily in this class on looking at outcrops. So just note that these other terms, like the transgressive surface or the sequence boundary, um, are ones that you'll likely encounter and perhaps use if you're working with seismic data. 
if you're working in more offshore settings, you might talk more about pair sequences um, because of the difficulty of recognizing all the systems tracks that you would get normally. So even though sequence cryptography is sort of scale independent, there are differences in the application and to some extent the terminology that you use depending on the scale and the settings in which you're working.